quite a story, isn't it? The story of the prodigal son. But we'll get on to that. I think uh, Romans chapter 7 is one of the most powerful chapters about struggling with sin. And what makes it powerful is that Paul gives us a glimpse into his own struggle. And for me that's quite encouraging. <coughs> Excuse me. Because often when I think of Paul, I think of him as someone who is, you know, a great apostle. He, um, I see him standing up defending his faith in front of the Roman governors and even the emperor. Um, he had his great missionary journeys all over the Roman Empire. And the way that he spent lots of time praying and sending the church's letters of encouragement and correction when they needed to. I think all these things um, maybe help to put Paul on a pedestal out of our realm. He just, but the thing is, he just had a different calling to what, what we have. But when we come to Romans, we get a peek behind the eyes of the Apostle and there's a lot more human than we, what we might have first thought because he's a fellow struggler. And if you notice what's going on here, Paul is honest enough to recognise within himself a tendency to get caught in the stranglehold of sin. It's not Paul talking about the way he used to be before when he was sinful, before he became a Christian. It's talking about how he is now, how he is in, in the letter in Romans. He's saying something like this just this morning I gave in again it happens to us all and earlier in his letter he proclaimed no one is righteous not even one and later he stated matter of factly all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God but now he states it even more personally I struggle with sin and sometimes I lose and finally the frustration of losing seems to break through to the surface as Paul proclaims how many times a week could we kick ourselves for falling and you know from the reading he says I do the things I don't want to do and I think we can really identify with that and um, I lost my page here <laughs> <clears throat> so I think that um, we try to do things in our own strength we struggle with knowing the things that we want to do and the things we don't want to do just like Paul we try to be patient with our kids with our husbands, <laughs> wives, <laughs> partners, <laughs> even parents. But, and we strike out and we say words that we wish we hadn't said because of the damage that they've done. And they've caused damage before we even <coughs> know it. And sometimes we think we've broken the grip on a bad habit, but there was that one week weak moment when we listened to the whisper that told us it'll be okay just this once you don't have to do it again and then you feel like a failure because you've given in again and you know you should have steered clear but you thought you could handle it and before you know it you found out the hard way that you're weaker than you thought and I've certainly experienced that and it is not always easy to believe are there times when you have a negative attitude? Well, what you probably mean is that you are a disappointment to yourself because you haven't lived up to your own high standards and your life isn't what you thought it would be at this point. Is it hard to imagine yourself as a positive, faith-filled person, full of hope? Well, if so, I know how you feel. <laughs> And Paul knew as well. 
And have you ever thought that you're a disappointment to God? Well, we've probably all gone there. But it isn't true. It can't be true if Romans 8.1 is true. That there is no, therefore no condemnation, condemnation in Jesus. And I can identify with Paul because at times I've been in that mindset. On an occasion in the last year when there was lots happening in the life of our family and our wider family, there were huge issues to actually deal with. And I was feeling quite overwhelmed and also frustrated with God because I was wanting an answer and I was wanting resolutions now. You know, I think they say that the young people have got a view of having an instant world. Well, I think we've somehow picked that up as well. I wanted an instant answer, but that wasn't going to come because God had some lessons to actually teach me. And I got frustrated because I wanted the resolutions to be seen. I was tired of waiting. And God never seemed to answer my prayers. And what was I doing that was wrong? Why he wasn't answering? Was I doing something wrong? Was there some sort of sin there? I couldn't see anything apart from unbelief. <laughs> but, you know, when you have an over an optimistic steward in your life <laughs> who comes along and says the obvious that I already knew that God is here even though you don't feel him just now that God is listening and God will answer and you get that encouragement but how annoying is it when you're having a good old wallow and along comes Mr Positive Optimist who tells you what you need to rehear and deep down want to hear but don't want to hear just now because you haven't finished following. <laughs> and you're not quite ready to surface. And it was so bad that I said to him, well, if I don't expect anything good to happen, then I won't be disappointed when it doesn't. That's how bad it got. And that explains why I was so miserable. And I was feeling condemned for something that I imagined was invisible for some sin that I couldn't see. And some people are simply afraid to hope because they've experienced so much disappointment and they don't want to and don't think they can face any more pain. And I actually felt in, somewhat in that position, but that's okay because God is the God of hope. He's full of mercy and new beginnings. And with him it's never too late to start believing, anticipating, hoping and expecting. And often we make the mistake of thinking that the gospel is simply what we believe in order to be saved. We hear it, we believe it and we're born again. And often we act like the gospel has no further relevance to us because we're in, so to speak. But it is supposed to be part of our daily life. And we need to preach that gospel to ourselves every day because I think every day we get caught up and we forget it. And Martin Luther said, or put it in his lectures on Romans, to progress is always to begin again. So real spiritual progress, in other words, requires a daily going backwards. We have to go back to the cross and start again with the a clean slate and I imagine a thousand times in a thousand different ways each of us have tried to live by the standards that we know are right and even though we knew better we've done something stupid we've said something wrong without thinking and we ask ourselves why did I say that and now all we feel is wretched to use Paul's language but Paul goes on and he admits that there is a struggle going on within every human being. And when we try to win on our own strength, we often hit the wall. But the greatness of the promise of God's grace is that even when we fall again, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is security in our relationship with God. 
And the truth of Romans 7 is actually part and parcel of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. There is a time to struggle. Sometimes people come to Jesus and they get upset because things don't go well for them. Maybe we give them the wrong message and say, become a Christian and everything will be fine. Well, it's not. <laughs> that is not reality. They get upset because they have relational difficulties, financial difficulties, personal difficulties, emotional difficulties, marital difficulties and problems in different way, areas of life. And they get discouraged, they get disillusioned and they get angry with God. And we probably all do that at some point and wonder what's wrong. And often there's nothing deeply wrong with anyone who's going through a period of struggle. It's just part and parcel of what it means to live on this earth. There is a struggle in the Christian life. But if we are in Christ, we don't need to wonder if God is angry with us. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If we have a personal relationship with Jesus, we don't need to fear his wrath. He's not going to reject us just because we struggle. When God looks at us, he sees a son or a daughter. And in the story of the prodigal son, the boy disregarded his father, disgraced himself in every way possible, spent all his money, and ended up in pig pen. The difference between the son and the pig pen and the pig is that the pig just continues to eat slops every day or whatever is given. But the boy decided that he could go to his father. And so he said, I will arise and go to my father. And a child can do that. And when that dirty, smelly boy came within eyesight of his home, his dad was there watching, waiting for him. He was there to clean him up and throw him a party. And Paul wants us to know that we and understand that God is just as anxious to throw his arms around us. We might come in that state that that boy came, but there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And God just wants to throw his loving arms around us and show us his grace. Doubt and negativity bring us down, but hope releases joy. The prodigal son hoped his dad would have him back and the father never gave up hope for the day when his son would return. And there was great joy for both of them. And it means, hope means having a positive mindset or attitude, like the hopeful person absolutely refuses to be negative in any way. And although we recognise and deal with the storms of life, they remain hopeful in thought, attitude and conversation. So many times I think we get caught in the trap of waiting until we feel optimistic or hopeful. But hope is a decision to be positive and not live by how we feel. The truth is that when we make a solid decision to think positive, hopeful thoughts, our feelings will eventually catch up. And it means that regardless of what happens in our lives, we refuse to stop hoping and trusting in God's ability to come through. In Christ Jesus, condemnation never comes from God. It only comes from Satan. He wants us to be like Adam and Eve in the garden when they sinned. All they wanted to do was hide from God. And the gift, truth is, we've all been there. We failed and kicked ourselves and felt condemned and we've hidden ourselves from God and turned away. But not because we don't love him necessarily, but because we are ashamed. We've felt a failure and we've listened to Satan tell us that God condemns us, that we're bad. And Paul recognises this, that we act according to what we know we are. If we are deceived into thinking, that we are not what God says we are, then we're going to keep on acting that way. 
we tell ourselves bad messages. That is why the way to break the power of the thing or the habit is to see ourselves as God sees us. And then we begin to act that way. Now, how many believe the Bible is true? Yeah, we all do. (laughs) So if we do, then we have to believe that verse. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And when we become full of hope, the enemy doesn't know what to do. Satan says, they are hopeful in God. How can I break this? He may come against us with negative thoughts, but he has no power to harm us when we are determined to continually put all of our trust in God. God just wants to bless us. He wants to restore the years that we've lost for the pain of the past and things that have been lost. And our part makes all the difference. It's to believe, to trust and to hope. The challenge that we face is not to just say that we believe God's word, but to live like it. We have to accept that what God says about us is true. If he says not condemned, then we are not condemned. And it means that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Not even our own and foolish and repeated mistakes. Don't let anything that we have ever done or will ever do separate us from God. For the believer in Jesus there is no condemnation because God has said it. We can struggle but we're not condemned. We can fall, but we're not condemned. We can trip or stray off the path, but we're not condemned. Because God has said he will not condemn us who are in Christ Jesus. When he saved us, he didn't say he would take away all our problems. But he did say in our problems, our struggles, our failures, our going astray, that there is no condemnation, that there is forgiveness. So when we fail or fall, what do we do? We turn to God. We repent. By God's grace, our eyes are open to see what we have done. We change our direction. We change our minds. We stop making excuses. We ask God to help us and move forward. And we let the Holy Spirit lead us. God knew we would need his spirit to help us live the way he wants us to. And further along, Paul says that if our thinking is controlled by the spirit and not self, there is peace and there is life. But you know, we have to stay tight with God. We have to spend time in prayer, in worship and in his word. If we work them into our life where they become a part of us, then we will know when his spirit is leading us and be able to stand firm. Christian growth, in other words, does not happen first by behaving better, but by believing better. Believing in bigger, deeper, brighter ways when Christ has already that Christ has already secured for us. We're not bound anymore. God doesn't have us on a performance standard in order to earn his grace. His grace is a gift. It's freely given. And I think that sometimes we don't accept that fully. And I know that um, when we had this problem in the family that it was quite it was very difficult to keep on believing but you know we did, we kept on praying, we kept on hoping and we just stood firm on God's promises and God honoured that and we had this prodigal son experience with our son And he had it too. And God's grace and God's love is just so overwhelming. And he restores those years 
I'm not going to tell you his story because he has a story to tell. But I can say that he is overwhelmed, as we are. And God answer, answers us just when we're not expecting him to answer. Just when we think we're going to give up. Just when we think God doesn't care. And that's because, you know, our feelings are coming into it. But we really just need to keep on and keep in with God and keep tight with him and to know that um, all these things God causes, brings all things for good to it for all of us. And you know, changing your thinking is not always easy. But taking hold of the promises and hanging on to them is the best thing for us to do. And I wonder, he desires, God desires us to actively anticipate something good. So what are you expecting? Are you expecting something good? Are you expecting God to come through? You've got to hang on to that hope. What are you seeing in your mind and imagination? How do you talk about your future? Do you think in the morning when you get up, well, I guess I'll try and make it through another day? Or do you wake up with that faith and anticipation that today might be the day you receive a breakthrough? Today might be the day that you hear something special from God. And we, in Hebrews 6.19 it says, We have this hope as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. It cannot slip, it cannot break down under whoever steps on it. We, I think we all know what an anchor is. When you want a boat to stay in one place, you drop the anchor and it allows, allows the boat to only move so far. Well, it says that hope is the anchor of the soul. Our soul is our mind and our will and our emotions. Our soul tells us what we think, what we want and what we feel. So what does it mean? It means that when everything looks bleak, when it seems like nothing makes sense and it feels like God's promises will never come to pass in our lives, hope is our anchor that pulls us back and says, hold on, hold on, it's still going to happen. Hope is our anchor and the very thing that causes us to step out. Some people are not experiencing the promises and power of God simply because they're not stepping out in faith. It's this stepping out that puts the promises of God into action. And God is just waiting for us to step onto that anchor of hope. He's waiting us, for do our, us to do our part so he can show up in our lives and do something that will really amaze us. Don't let the circumstances of life blow you off course. And don't let condemnation rob us of what God has in store and of who we are in Christ. Drop your anchor and step out on the sure foundation of hope because when you put your hope in God, you won't be disappointed. <laughs>